High efficiency uh, gas turbine combined cycle power system in Indonesia. A uh, 500 megawatt Muara Karan power plant, uh, for which our gas turbine combined cycle technology is applied, has already uh, started operation in 2021 and uh, keep the supplying the uh, stable electricity uh, to the important facility like uh, Tsukaruno Hatta International Airport or uh, many residences in Jakarta. And uh, we also have uh, so many experience to supply the geothermal power plant in Indonesia. And now we are supporting the uh, Fudutamina geothermal energy uh, for the construction of 55 in Sumatra. It's 88% actually powered by biomass, so it's from renewable sources. What's fascinating is we want to go beyond just the 88%, we want to go closer to 90, 95%. And this journey started about five years ago um, by installing solar panels, actually. Uh, we realized that the solar panel cost was quite cheap. Back then, it was still about 1 million US dollar per megawatt. It's much cheaper now. Uh, and we decided to install it on retired landfills because these landfills are not being utilized and we were putting them, putting them on subsurface areas. And at that point of time in 2021, 2022, coal prices went to record high. So there was this beautiful conflux of coal prices going high, solar panel price coming down, and it became an economic reason to invest in solar panel. It wasn't about going green, it was about saving money. The payback for the solar panel at that point of time, if I generate power from the solar panel of one megawatt, the payback was about six and a half years. So that's the beauty of the market force. Fast forward five years later, we've installed almost 26 megawatt of solar panels across our all our landfill permits, um, and we're able to actually generate good returns, uh, return on investment on on these on these projects. So that's on the on the solar panel opportunity. Um, so I do agree, I think with this kind of lower prices of solar panel, actually, as private sector, the time to seize the opportunity is actually now. Um, interestingly, in our palm oil CPO mills, um, there's also a huge opportunity to do biogas. Uh, these are biogas actually from <laughs> effluent treatment plants, so these are regular effluent treatment plants. And what you're doing actually, when, when the effluent decomposes, you're releasing methane into the atmosphere. Everyone knows methane is six to seven times worse for greenhouse gas emissions compared to even carbon dioxide. What you can do, however, is to capture the methane into a biogas plant and generate power. Two to three megawatt of power. Now with newer technology, Japanese technology can generate five, six megawatt of, of power from biogas. And again, it is purely economic. So the beauty of our industry, I think it's come to a tipping point where going green is not only to go green, but going green is to go after the green, which is money. Um, and the opportunity, I think, moving ahead for us, uh, maybe in a few hours' time we'll hear the announcement, uh, RG is also moving into power generation uh, from the solar perspective uh, in a large way to seize the opportunity both from Indonesia and also in other countries in the region. Um, because what's fascinating in Indonesia is we have, we have a lot of surface area. I mean, uh, you just imagine how much uh, agricultural land actually that can actually be potentially even utilized to generate power on the solar front. So what does it take for us to really achieve the transition in the next few years? I think it takes the private sector to be bold and try it out. And try it out not because you want to be green, but you actually want to pay back and have save money. That's one. Second, I think what it takes for us to really transition aggressively is the same thing that happened in solar panel, PV, to happen in battery. The challenge right now is battery cost is still extremely expensive. So I was asking the first question, why can't we go from 26 megawatt to 50 megawatt to 200 megawatt for our factories? The fact of the matter is, it cannot be a base load because the battery and energy storage is still very, very expensive. So what needs to happen in order for us to accelerate further is what has happened in photovoltaic business also occur in the battery side so that battery costs can continue to come down. Um, the opportunities are immense, I think, from the private sector, and we're, we're happy to be able to participate in it. Yeah, I mean, going run directly back to John's point about some of these, those enabling technologies and how they're changing so quickly. And while I think uh, RGE, obviously, uh, is going into the 
solar space and uh, all of the land that might be available is good. Uh, still, when we talk about the uh, biogas and biofuel market, uh, uh, as well as the rest of your business, there is still a, an element of that, a component, which is about sustainable forest management, which is something I think you also uh, have been engaged in. Right? Right, so? Okay. Um, of course, you know, Indonesia is, is a huge land use area. I mean, we, we are the largest producer of palm oil, one of the largest producers of cellulose pulp. Uh, but what we can do is do it, do it sustainably, right? Um, for example, our used cooking oil and effluent is actually collected back as recycled oil to be sold as second generation biodiesel feedstock to one of our largest customers, Neste, which does SAP, Sustainable Aviation Fuel. So if you're going after the premium market, but you're not able to get the right practices on the ground, whether it's RSP or certification and traceability, that jeopardizes the whole business model. So as companies go through these transformations, it's very important to remind ourselves, but also execute on the ground, that if we really want our biodiesel to be sold internationally and globally at the right premium prices, we must get our actions on the ground right in terms of sustainability. That is traceability, certification, and what we champion, which is production protection, where you produce from a landscape, but you also conserve and protect the landscape. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Anderson. You know, we're, we've been talking about technology, uh, so I want to go a little bit more into some of the technologies we're talking about, about decarbonizing the power sector. And again, maybe Toru, I can, I can come back to you, just because also uh, MHI is engaged in so many. You mentioned some of them around geothermal, uh, also solar, also uh, various kinds of turbines in traditional energy. Uh, but uh, 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 Mitsubishi Heavy Industries has also been involved in carbon capture, uh, which has been uh, playing a large role, uh, particularly in a place like Indonesia. Uh, can you talk about uh, some of the, let's say, the key technology when it comes to the Indonesian market that you see uh, to accelerate the energy transition, let's say, over the next decade? Uh, Decarbonizing of uh, Indonesia's energy system uh, requires a range of technical solutions, especially the coal dominate uh, country, the electricity mix. Uh, a phase and a just uh, approach is necessary to support its energy transition while ensuring the energy security. Uh, renewable energy like uh, solar and wind is very important. Uh, but the uh, uh, issue of the intermittency uh, remains to be resolved. On the other hand, that the uh, alternative fuel can support its uh, energy transition with uh, stabilizing the grid. Uh, for example, uh, our hydrogen ready gas turbine can be used in the existing gas turbine combined cycle power plant in Indonesia. And, uh, Ammonia co-firing boiler can help decarbonize the existing coal-fired power plant in Indonesia. Uh, also, uh, Indonesia has a huge potential of uh, CO2 stretch. Uh, it is very important to explore how to leverage this potential uh, with decarbonizing this uh, existing infrastructure through our advanced technology of carbon capture. Uh, also, uh, considering the expansion of export and uh, import trade with the uh, overseas countries, uh, explore, <coughs> exploring of the uh, carbon neutral port also is important to be realized. Uh, adding to the decarbonizing infrastructure, uh, like uh, bunkering for uh, sustainable fuel vessel to the existing port, uh, provide uh, opportunity for the scale, uh, resource sharing, and uh, efficiency for the industrial facility, uh, most of which are located in the same area, and uh, can help uh, reduce their scope 3 emission also. Uh, however, uh, such a kind of solutions and approach uh, the, at the early stage of the development and the deployment and uh, need more support. Uh, collaboration with the stakeholders uh, across the sectors is very important to uh, accelerate the uh, such adoption of these solutions. 
Uh, we have a uh, technological capability to support this uh, energy transition and uh, working with uh, many stakeholders uh, to study uh, financial and the regulatory framework uh, that is uh, uh, really necessary to the, the, the accelerate the adoption of the, the, such a kind of solutions. Uh, so that uh, Indonesia can reduce the emission while uh, continue to uh, utilize the existing infrastructure uh, to meet uh, Indonesia's energy and economic growth. Right. Uh, thank you much. Uh, Dennis, Satoru mentioned a couple of uh, challenges that are out there. He talked about uh, the need for grid flexibility. Uh, he talked a little bit about uh, regulatory uh, and legal uh, structures that need to be in place. Uh, and uh, in fact, Anderson was also talking about the high cost of storage uh, at the moment. Uh, maybe you could talk, uh, you, know, you mentioned how cheap uh, solar is, and certainly solar panels are very cheap. Uh, but there's much more to the solar value chain, obviously, into getting solar power than just panels. So uh, what do you see are maybe some of the challenges uh, to making solar more economically uh, viable and accessible, and what needs to change, particularly in Indonesia, to make uh, the expansion of solar happen even better? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned that solar is incredibly cheap at this moment. So, <coughs> the price of the, the cost of the solar panel is there. <coughs> However, we have a new challenge. Different regions have a region like Europe, China, we already have a lot of solar and electricity that we call. Right, then, can you just go quick closer to the place? So, I mentioned in Europe, in China, kind of regions, we already have a lot of renewable energy has been deployed. So, the challenge will be okay, the impermanent. Solar renewable energy and bring the challenge to the grid. Solar renewable energy, if you want to make this at the best load, so how to uh, on the one hand how how to be how to that fit to the grid better together with uh, uh, the new or the low cost of this storage different kind of storage. And I think that's a one challenge. Uh, the other challenge is that I mean. In the past, I think all the consumers of energy consumers, they've been you know, they used to the traditional energy. But today, I believe that um, we have a new challenge. The old, you know, the new, the, the consumers had started to embrace this kind of new system and more and more renewable energy. So I do see, you know, today, there are more and more industries start to, you know, uh, build up uh, their the consumption uh, better friendly to the renewable energy. Like in China, we we bring more and more data center to Western China, where we have better and more you know, cheaper renewable energy. And so, also 